What's up, U.S. History Kids? Mr. Tomei here. Back at it with another video. Today we're going to be talking about Imperial Japan, the U.S. entry into World War II, getting the perspective kind of back on uh, the United States. Um, learn a little bit kind of about, you know, how we got dragged in to uh, this world war. Uh, let's go ahead and get into it, and then we'll go from there. So uh, in our last video, we talked about kind of what was going on in Europe. Today, we're going to talk about what's going on in the United States, and we also got to look at what's going on in Asia, the Pacific Theater, and Japan. So in the United States, we were watching kind of what was going on with the Carefly. At the time, American opinion, we really didn't want to go to war. We, we thought it was, again, a European issue. It's not our problem. We were also just, you know, coming out of the depression, starting to clean ourselves off, you know, feel better about ourselves. Um, but we did have some basic alliances with some of the other countries. We were somewhat cautious of what, um, you know, Adolf Hitler, Benito Mussolini were doing and so on and so forth. So um, we, we passed a series of laws that were all designed to indirectly, crack the neck, indirectly, um, you know, get us involved in the war. Um, so these included, you know, the banning of trading of war materials with any country that was involved in war. We didn't give loans to people involved in war. Um, we prevented travel and trade to countries involved in war, um, you know, and we increased a lot of supervision of trade that of, to the countries involved in war. We really want to stay out of it. Um, and uh, we tried our best in the years leading up to our involvement to kind of curtail, um, economically speaking, especially with trade, um, some of the war um, obviously wasn't fully successful. This is just an image shown all out aid to our allies. We'd give a lot of aid to allies as well, um, indirectly on the low. So do the British, the French. Especially driving home the Smith Act. This happened in 1940. Uh, this was a law designed to target Nazi, fascist, communist, and any anarchist sympathizers. So basically, if you were affiliated in any type of way with that movement, right, you were, you know, could be subject to penalty under this act. Similar to like uh, what went down back in the roaring 20s with the Palmer Raids, there was an act known as the 1917 Espionage Act. Again, all designed to protect national interests. Remember this guy, FDR, we talked about him in our last unit. Um, the year is now 1941, and here's kind of where we're at. Germany was winning the war with ease in, in Europe, and Japan was doing the same in Asia. It was becoming clear what was going to happen is that eventually the next big powerful country that was still left standing would be the United States. And it would only be a matter of time before either Japan or Germany or Italy, right, before they decide to gain up on us. Um, on top of that, Germany had already been sinking U.S. ships that were going across the Atlantic, right? They didn't want us trading at all with the British, the French. Um, so quietly on the low, FDR and Congress began to increase military spending and instituted the first ever peacetime draft. Even though we weren't in war, there was a military draft. Again, the writing was on the wall. We were gonna have to go to war at some point. We couldn't just keep avoiding the issue. I think we learned a little bit maybe from our previous uh, history with World War I, um, that the Europeans couldn't take care of Hitler and Mussolini and the countries in Asia couldn't take care of uh, the Japanese. So eventually it was gonna be up to us. Um, one big uh, move that really kind of signaled where we were going to head and who we were going to back was the Lend-Lease Act, and this was in 1941. It pretty much terminated the neutrality acts that said we're not going to go support anyone with war. Um, this one straight out said openly we are going to support free France because France had fallen at this point to the Germans, the United Kingdom, China with money, oil, and food. These are all countries that are fighting against either Japan, Italy, Germany. Again, not yet directly fighting, 
Um, most of the world saw this as the United States siding on the allies. And this would really ultimately set the table um, for each side who's gonna be where during World War II. Now we transition talking about Japan. Japan had their own intentions of building an empire right around the same time the Germans and the Italians were doing what they were doing in Europe. Japan was ruled by this guy, Emperor Showa or Hirohito. Um, that dude actually was emperor of Japan till 1989. Kind of crazy. Um, he was alive up until a couple of years before I was born. Um, seen a lot. Uh, Japan began to invade neighboring countries, started with Korea, then they invaded and attacked China, and then they worked their way through Southeast Asia. Along the way, they committed a lot of horrible human atro right atrocities. Um, the infamous rape of Nanking, or Nanjing, I should actually change that. Um, uh, and we'll talk about that here in a little bit. Some events you should know, one of the bigger ones that kind of started the uh, invasion into mainland China was this thing called the Manchurian incident. Uh, Japan kind of manipulated, spun, spun the news a little bit. So Japan blew up its own railway owned by a Japanese train company. They then blamed the Chinese. And then that set the stage for Japan to be like, well, we get to invade now because you guys attacked uh, our train, even though it was all fraudulent, right? Manchuria is the northeastern region of China up here. At this point, Japan had already conquered Korea. Um, and so they were working their way up here. <clears throat> and then this kind of just shows you over time the extent of their empire. Again, controlled the populated areas of China, uh, controlled most of Southeast Asia and the, uh, some of these uh, Southeast Asian Pacific Island nations. Um, and you can see how it's spread over time. Um, and yeah, this is just another map that kind of shows you the extent of the empire of Japan during kind of this period. Talking about the rape of Nanjing, uh, Japan's occupation across Asia, it was always led with violence, human rights abuses. Uh, there's a large city known as Nanjing. Um, and in this city, as the Japanese were invading and capturing the city, they looted it. But along the way, uh, there were all un there was significantly large numbers. It's really never going to be known, but could be tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands even of men, women and children tortured and raped, uh, beheaded, disarmed, dismembered, um, brutalized. Um, this is one of the more infamous um, incidents of kind of like a human rights uh, issue, which ex exists um, it happened a lot in World War II, unfortunately, uh, both in Asia and in Europe. Estimates vary. Um, there's different reports depending on which country you ask and whatnot, but anywhere from about 100,000 to 300,000 people were killed in the month-long siege of the city. Um, and again, the numbers for rape, dismembered, tortured, I mean, is unknown. It could be in the hundreds of thousands. Um, so pretty crazy, uh, crazy blood, lust, and event. Um, war is not good, no matter where, whatever the war, it's never good. Um, all right, you see the bodies here lined up. Yeah, uh, you see, you know, people dismembered, people about to be killed, forced kind of sexual, relations and marriages, rape, um, sometimes with, you know, little girls and grown soldiers. It, it's all tough stuff to talk about. So as the United States was hearing and obviously witnessing this on the other side of the Pacific Ocean, they were kind of worried about the Japanese aggression that was going on. So they did two things. Number one, they stopped all trade shipment of oil to Japan and without oil, you needed oil to run a war. And the United States had a lot of oil and they were giving it to the Japanese. And then once they kind of saw Japan was getting a little, little bit too crazy and a little bit too aggressive, they cut that off. So obviously it's gonna make the Japanese a little bit upset because they need that oil to run a war. The other big thing that happened was we moved our Pacific fleet 
from Southern California, San Diego, to the middle of the Pacific Ocean, which is Hawaii, which Hawaii is roughly, and I'll show you a map, uh, Hawaii is roughly the middle of the Pacific Ocean. And we're gonna talk about the importance of like Hawaii's location. But the US wanted to be a little bit more closer to Japan to kind of protect itself and be prepared if Japan tried to do something. Japan clearly was not happy about this. They saw the moving of the fleet as a sign of aggression and they're gonna respond and with a pretty famous event that we're gonna talk about. This is just to show you there's San Diego, here's the Bay Area, Hawaii over here. On a bigger scale, this is the Pacific Ocean. Japan is here, the United States is here, Hawaii is here. Hawaii is roughly the halfway point in the Pacific Ocean between the United States and Japan, like Southeast Asia, roughly the halfway point. That in a gigantic ocean, right, you need islands so that you can refuel your ships, you can resupply your ships and your planes, you can set up medical tents for your sick and hurt soldiers. You can't do that on a, um, a, a floaty device in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. You need control of the various islands that are spread out across the Pacific Ocean. And once you get to Hawaii, there's not many more islands that are habitable or suitable in terms of size, weather, conditions um, from Hawaii to the United States. There's a lot more islands kind of from Hawaii to Japan, but Hawaii to the United States, there's not that much. So if you control Hawaii, you control the most sizable islands, right? To launch an attack on the United States and Japan knows this, right? Japan was able to capture Hawaii. They then could launch attacks or an invasion on the West coast of the United States. The United States knew that as well. That's why they moved their fleet there. Pearl Harbor is on the island, uh, the uh, island of Oahu. Um, it's actually, if you've ever been to Hawaii, um, when you fly into Honolulu, you actually see um, where Pearl Harbor is. It's a little harbor. And we had a bunch of our ships, planes, a lot of oil fields and whatnot, um, all lined up. Um, almost kind of too like perfectly lined up. And uh, that's gonna come back to, uh, to haunt us a little bit. Uh, the Japanese knew where we had our ships. They knew it was there and they were gonna take advantage through a surprise attack. And that a surprise attack is the attack on Pearl Harbor. Um, this happened early in the morning. It was a Sunday. Um, this was uh, December 7, 1941. Uh, so almost 1942. Um, and Japan's goal through this attack was to eliminate our capability as a country to defend ourselves um, and eliminate our Pacific fleet. Because if we don't have a Navy fleet in the Pacific, right, it's going to take too long for us to rebuild. It's going to take too much of a risk and too long for us to take our ships all the way around or through the Panama Canal. And it leaves us open to an attack. And it leaves us very vulnerable and it pretty much cripples our ability to defend ourselves or wage war. Ja Japan's goal was to eliminate the fleet. Um, and their attack was successful. It was a surprise attack. It was a Sunday morning, pretty early. A lot of people either at church or still sleeping. Um, and the aftermath was that this was a major Japanese tactical victory. Um, Japanese didn't really take many losses, and they destroyed a significant amount of American battleships and cruisers. Um, it was a pretty crushing blow to the United States. Um, in total, about 2,400 Americans were killed. Um, the majority of those were aboard the USS Arizona. Um, a lot of people at Pearl Harbor died by drowning. They were stuck on the ships that were sinking. They weren't able to get off. Um, some people you know, as oil kind of leaked into the, um, leaked out because there's so much oil in those ships and whatnot in the surrounding buildings and containers. Um, that oil would catch on fire. People would fall in, catch on fire, um, die from smoke inhalation. Um, that's mostly how people died. It's primarily through drowning, burning, smoke inhalation, things like that. 
Um, and it would be the worst attack on American soil until 9-11, actually. Um, and this is the event that brings us in to World War II. Uh, this is, we have to respond. We have to, you know, at this point, finally enter the war. Um, that's a picture of the USS Arizona. Um, you can go visit there. Um, I haven't gotten to. I'm hopeful that in the coming years I'll be able to and take some pictures for you guys. But that's it. Again, the harbor, it's not very deep and these ships are pretty big. So even when they sink, um, you can actually kind of go out and you can look down and the water so clear in Hawaii, right, that you can see um, the ship itself. And it's very eerie from what I've heard and, and kind of stunning to see the size of the ship just right underneath um, and sunk there in the harbor. Um, think about the people who died, right? Over half the people died at Pearl Harbor on that ship. And this event changed the course of world history, right? Um, who knows what would happen if the Japanese had never attacked us, how that would have changed the course of war, who knows? Um, this is an excerpt from an um, actual uh, Japanese like pilot, um, one of the dive bombers, Senji Abe. And he's talking about, even if you were executed in an early morning attack, you may not hurt your opponent if he is sleeping. You must make him stand and then go at him with your sword. This is Bushido. Bushido is like the warrior way, samurai kind of way. It's a big part of like, at the time, it was a big part of like the military mentality in Japan. Um, and he talks about how this attack actually violated their nation's ideals. Um, he says he felt bad. There's actually a picture of him with a survivor of Pearl Harbor. Um, and they're like, you know, embracing each other. It's kind of crazy. That's him as the young dude. FDR then gives a famous speech. It's called A Day Which Will Live in Infamy. I'm not going to play it for you, but um, pretty much says, you know, we're going to go to war. And this is how the sides then break down. The Allied powers, a lot of countries are involved. Here's the ones I want you to know. The United States, Soviet Union, France, what was left of free France, the United Kingdom, and China. On the other side, the Axis powers, Italy, Germany, and Japan. That'll be a test question, 100%. Um, with that being said, yep, that's it. Um, so that's the video. Make sure to do your homework assignment. And if you have any questions for me, let me know. I'll talk to you guys later.